When I was in the uh, Memphis School of Preaching, uh, we went five days a week to class. And Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you took, um, let's see, four classes. And each one of them uh, lasted for 50, let's see, we had a 50-minute class and then another 50-minute class. And then we had an hour class. Uh, and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we only had two classes, and each of those were three-hour classes. The reason I say that is this. Um, when you're studying Scripture, it's a lot more fun to be able to spend a lot of time and get a lot more of what's going on than it is to do like we do in Bible class. You get about 40 minutes, you barely get into it, and the bell rings and it's over with. And then next week we have something special that comes up, so we don't get to have Bible class, we do something else. And so you miss it for a week, and you, oh, you go, man, this seems like it's forever since we've been in class. And that happens from time to time, so it makes it hard to uh, sometimes maintain the uh, stability of the class, to maintain the consistency of the class, and uh, there's not much we can do about it except just labor on, don't we? And... Uh, I guess like Solomon said, this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. It vexates my spirit. <laughs> I don't even know if vexates a word. But anyway, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and we've gotten down to verse 22 of the text. And remember, uh, Solomon is looking at life, is he not? And he has one question in mind and the question very simply is what? Yes. Why am I here? What is my real purpose? And because of his position, because of his wealth, because of the peacefulness of his kingdom, he is able to carry on a massive experiment, isn't he? Now what's interesting is, as you read through the book, he sometimes confuses us, doesn't he? Because sometimes he'll say one thing about something, and you'll go, yep, that's true. And then he comes to another verse and he'll say something else about the subject that he just said and it seems as though it's contradictory in nature. But sometimes we can look at things from two different perspectives, can't we? Okay? Um, and, and that's what Solomon does. And so sometimes when Solomon says something, uh, it's the absolute truth. And then when he says something that seems to contradict it, it is the absolute truth as well. It's just the flip side of the coin. So uh, we have to be aware of that as we're studying this particular book. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 22. Uh, one of the things that Solomon really involved himself in was labor. Okay. Uh, do men and women dedicate themselves to a lot of work in their lives? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, many, especially those who are older, uh, when did you really start work? It wasn't when you got 18, was it? It wasn't when you got 22. It wasn't when your parents finally threw you out at 36. Okay? When did you start work? Man, there's some individuals who started work sometimes as early as five and six years old if you grew up on a farm. You know that? There are some individuals who started work at maybe 12, 13, 14 years old if they babysat, cut grass, threw newspapers. There's a lot of individuals who started work at 16 because that's when you could finally go out and get a real job, couldn't you? And get put on a payroll somewhere. So, uh, uh, and then you figure we live to be, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old. And of our lives, we've worked way over half of our lives. And sometimes those jobs have involved not just eight hours, they've involved 10 hours, 12 hours, 14 hours. There's some individuals who even work 24-hour shifts, don't they? And uh, so very, very difficult. We put in a lot of time and a lot of effort. And so Solomon just knew, if I'll look into labor, surely labor will make me what? Happy. And I'll be fulfilled. And when he did, he found out what? That's not the case at all. Jeannie, what were you going to say? There ain't much difference. 
<laughs> you know, I got to cut my grass uh, and, and I got to come to work, you know. Uh, but uh, it, it really doesn't matter the kind of labor. His, his main focus was uh, on about anything a man did, okay. Uh, there's some individuals who build their own house, right, in order to save themselves money. And, um, you know, Solomon built a lot of houses. He built a lot of uh, uh, gardens and vineyards. He built a lot of cities. He built a lot of stables. Solomon built all kinds of things. And after he got through with all of that labor, he says, what? It's just vanity and vexation of spirit. And the reason he said that is because at the end of it all, what happens? We die. And all that time and all that energy and all that effort doesn't hardly mean a thing, does it? Notice chapter 2, 22. For what hath the man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart, whereat he has labored under the sun? Notice what I've got in your notes there. There have been very few individuals who while laying on their deathbeds were concerned about all the things they had labored for during their life. You know that? That's not their concern. Never heard a man laying on his deathbed said, Hey, why don't you call my realtor and see how much my house is worth? (laughs) Ain't nobody who cares about that. Not on your deathbed. And yet, you worked and worked and worked and worked in order to do what? Buy that house. Wouldn't it be amazing to know how many hours you spent to pay for that house? Especially with interest. They're not concerned about the stock market's closing numbers, are they? Never heard anybody on his deathbed say, what was the NASDAQ today? They don't care. It's just something you're not concerned with. They're not concerned about booking a vacation. They're not even concerned about paying the next month's bills, are they? Not on their deathbed. Folks, when you get to the edge of death, guess what? There ain't nothing much that you've done in this life as far as work and labor and toil that matters. You know that? You don't even think about it. It's all what? Vanity. That's amazing, isn't it? When death comes, what hath a man of all his labor? What hath he? You don't have much, do you? Man. He has a lot of things he'll leave behind. He has a lot of things he'll give to others. He has a lot of things that others will care nothing for. And he has a lot of things that others will not use properly, even if they get it. Can you imagine? We work and work and work and work and guess what? We get to the end of it all and almost everything we have means what? Means nothing. Is that the way we view life while we're living? No. And that's the next note. It's difficult for us to truly grasp the significance of Solomon's words while we're young, healthy, and attempting to accumulate our wealth and assets, isn't it? It's just hard for us to even think like this. And when somebody comes along and says it, we want the person to think he's an idiot, doesn't he? Oh, Solomon, you don't know what you're talking about. There's a lot of profit in labor. There's a lot of good in it. And you just argue with Solomon? And you're arguing with who? The wisest man on the earth. And in this context, you're not only arguing with the wisest man on the earth, you're arguing with who? A man of God, aren't you? A man inspired by God. So, you know, argue with him all you want to. You'll never win that argument. But you see, right now when we're young and healthy, our labor involves the bulk of our time, doesn't it? Right now is the time when we are enjoying the fruits of our labors, aren't we? We finally get that paycheck, we save up a while, and guess what we get to do? We go out to get and buy something wonderful. Work is great. I couldn't have that couch. I couldn't have that wonderful wardrobe. I couldn't have that new car if I didn't what? 
If it didn't work, who are you to tell me work's bad? Right now, when we're young and healthy, death seems a long, long, long time away, doesn't it? I'm 63, and death still seems a long way away for me. Now, I know that I could be fooled by that. You know what? I understand that. But just in my, you know, just, just being honest with you, you know, I don't sit here and wake up thinking, you know, I'm going to die today. Or I'm going to die in the next month. I don't even think that I'm going to die in the next five years. I mean, not, I, mean, I know it can happen, but that's not my thinking. Okay? Now, you that are 80, 90, and 100, I don't, I don't know how y'all think. Do y'all think any different than that? Bill, do you think you're going to die in the next week or so? See, isn't it weird how we think? You know, Bill said, no. He said, I thought I was going to die yesterday. <laughs> uh, but, but isn't it funny how we just don't think that way? And because we don't think that way, we deceive ourselves, don't we? And we make things that are not really important the most important things in our life, and they're really not. It's sad. The things that we have grow old, they spoil, they wear out, don't they? Those who come after us tear them down, rebuild them, put something new in their place, you know? You have a nice house, you love it. Right? You leave it to your kids. If you were to come back in two years after you died and walk back in that house, what have you done to my house? Okay. Well, I made it livable for one thing. I cleared out the junk for the second thing. And I put some good stuff in here rather than all that old junk you had in here for another thing. Right? They just totally do away with our wonderful stuff. We downsize, don't we? Selling for pennies what we spent dollars, in fact, hundreds of dollars for, don't we? You ever go to a yard sale? Oh, yeah, you know. Go to a yard sale and you find some nice stuff, don't you? You know, those little uh, bows, uh, speaker, or radios and speakers and sound systems. Uh, you go to buy one of those brand new, they cost you around, oh, five, six hundred dollars, okay? If you go to a good yard sale, you might pick you up one for about a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars, okay? Pretty nice, isn't it? But just think about that. Somebody spent five, six hundred dollars to get it new, and they're willing to give it to you for a hundred dollars. Go out and buy you a brand new ping pong table, okay? Brand new, three, four hundred dollars. Go on Facebook Marketplace and you'll find some people willing to give it to you if you come pick it up. Okay? Same thing is true with a piano, especially one of them big upright pianos. Okay? Sometimes, brand new, those things cost thousands of dollars. They'll, they'll tell you this, just come pick it up and you can have it, but you better bring you a lot of people because it's heavy. But they're willing just to give it away. But think how long they worked and labored to get it. And now they're just going to give it away. Sometimes we do just give things away, don't we? I know, for the most part, you know, I've, my, the books in my library, probably the bulk of them will just be given to somebody. Whether it be a younger preacher, or whether it be a preacher training school or something, most of them are just going to be given away. And there's thousands of dollars that I've spent on those things. It's amazing, isn't it? Proverbs 23, 5. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Man. He continues talking about work and labor. For all his days are sorrows. And his travail grief, yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This also is what? Vanity. Anybody ever complained about their job? Nobody? You know? 
I bet you every one of us at some time has groaned and moped and complained about our job, hadn't we? All his days are what? Sorrow and his travail, grief. That little word sorrows means this. Anguish, affliction, pain, sorrow. That little word travail, his job, his employment, his task, brings him what? Grief. And look how grief is defined by Brown, Driver, and Briggs. Anger, vexation, provocation, grief, frustration. Anybody ever felt that about your job? Oh man, it's unbelievable, isn't it? You know? We act like what? Oh, my job is just the greatest little thing in the world. <laughs> and yet you really set somebody down and get to talking about their job, and guess what? It's the thing that brings them some of the worst grief in all their life. Look at the point number three there. There are many things about our job that create hardships, aren't there? Relationships. Just, just having to work with other people, does that cause problems sometimes? You email somebody with a question, they ain't emailers. So guess what they don't do? They don't answer you back for three weeks. I needed an answer yesterday the day I gave you the email. Well, I just don't check my emails. Oh. But you're the dude in charge. You're supposed to check your emails. Oh. Never had a disagreement with anybody at your work, have you? Nobody? You just don't want to talk about it, do you? You know, I, I, bet, you could, I bet you there's some people in here who could write a book about it. Okay. Uh-oh, Beverly, I don't know if I want to hear about it. <laughs> Goodness gracious. She, she'll tell you some stories, man. Here's what she'll say. Well, I didn't, but Bill did. Oh, now. <laughs> Did y'all complain about her? It's a long time. But that one person, just one person can make a, a, a place of work miserable, can it? Great place. Great place to work for, wasn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Kathleen used to work at the hospital and she got the VA caller. Yeah, come to work. Oh boy, I get to serve serve my country and serve these servicemen. And now guess what she knows? It's just an old government job. 
just a government job. When you get a government job, you know, there's some headache in those government jobs, aren't there? You know, guys, there's nothing perfect, is it? What about this? Time delays, communication problems, supply issues, mechanical failures, customers. All those things create what? Sorrow, grief, travail, work. Okay. Uh, what's that? <laughs> there are some opportunities there. That's right. Notice that Solomon even says that our work impacts our sleep, doesn't it? His heart taketh not rest in the night. There's not a person who has ever lost any, never lost sleep over their job, right? You ever lost sleep over your job? Never. Never. Uh, I need, Rod, Rodney needs to be up here teaching this section right here. <laughs> Rodney could give us some good stories, couldn't you, Rodney? Oh, yeah. Um, there's been a many people who've lost sleep over their jobs, haven't they? You know, it's all you can think about uh, sometimes. And uh, you just toss and turn. And, uh, and so Solomon, Solomon's trying to get us to see the realities of what sometimes... We think here's the most important thing in life, right? Is our job, our work. And he says, guys, you know, th there's some parts of this that aren't good. You know, there's a lot of travail. There's a lot of labor. There's a lot of grief. There's a lot of problems. And, and it's just vanity and vexation of spirit. And that's what he calls it. It is the emptiness of good. It involves substantial misery, doesn't it? And so he's trying to get individuals to have the right idea of work. Uh, work is not our God. Okay? God is our God. And work is not. And yet sometimes we um, make, the, make our work our God. But now notice, he gets to 24, and it's like he flips the switch. Doesn't he? See, this is where Solomon gets you confused. Listen to what he says. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. Uh, Solomon, you just told me how bad work is. You just told me that it's vanity and vexation of spirit. You just told me that it causes grief and anguish. And now he says what? Enjoy it. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Notice that first statement there. Why do people work? Right? Why do, why do we work anyway? You know, there's some people who work because they like to work. Isn't that true? You know? And you say, there, there's a doctor that I go to, or used to go to. He was uh, in his 80s, okay? And he was still working. And he was working as many hours as he worked when he was 20 and 30 years old. And his son worked side by side with him. COVID comes along. He's an 80-year-old man. Dad, you don't need to be down here. You don't need to be working. You need to stay home. You know what he'd do? He'd sneak to the office and sneak in the back door and have his mask on because he wanted to what? He wanted to work. Why? Because he loved what he did. You know? It wasn't about the money it wasn't about, you know, all the stuff he could accumulate. He just liked doing what he did. And he'll probably die doing it. Okay, and some people do. Now, most of us enjoy our work, right? But, <laughs> you know, 55, 65, 70 comes along and guess what? I'm about sick of this. You know? It's time to what? It's time to retire. Okay? You know, you don't, you don't love it that much. And they give you a good package to keep you there and you can still what? Nah. I'm done. But I thought you loved your job. I do. But not that much. You see, why do we work? It's not to work the rest of our lives, is it? We work to eat and drink, and to provide the basic necessities of life, don't we? We work in order to have maybe a few of the luxuries of life, don't we? 
You know, it's kind of nice every now and then to go out and purchase one of those real nice things, okay? A 200-foot screen television, okay? To watch the Jaguars whoop up on somebody at the very last minute, okay? <laughs> Maybe we want to have ourselves security, right? We want to have a nice home in which to live and bring up our kids, uh, maybe we are looking down the road and, you know, we know we don't want to work the rest of our lives, so what do we do? We sock away a lot of money, don't we? So that when that time comes, we can retire. You see, our jobs aren't necessarily our life. They just help us to enjoy some other things that we desire out of life, and that's what Solomon is talking about. There's nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that he should what? Make his soul enjoy the good of his labor. Okay? And there is some good in that. Solomon makes an interesting affirmation, doesn't he? This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. Man. That's good right there. One of the things we need to realize... There's times when Solomon almost acts as though he's omitting God from life, right? It's the way, it's, the way he writes. It sounds like... He, but as you read through the entirety of the book, all of a sudden, he throws God into the mix again, doesn't he? And he, Just like labor. He says, okay, labor's vanity, labor's vexation of spirit. But then he turns right around and he says, there's good in labor, and guess what? This is from the hand of God. Guess who ordained work? God did, didn't He? Absolutely. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to what? To dress it and to keep it. When God put man into the Garden of Eden, He didn't say, I just want you to live here like you're on welfare. That's not what he said. I'm going to put you in the garden and I need you to do some things. I need you to dress it and what? And keep it. There was some work that was involved for that first couple. There were some things that they had to do in order to dress and keep that garden. Now, when they fell from the grace of God, what was the difference? Yes, now the ground was cursed wasn't it? And now it was going to take a lot more effort and a lot more toil. There's going to be thorns. There's going to be thistles. There's going to be pain. There's going to be anguish. There's going to be the sweat of thy face. Work got hard. It wasn't that God had not given them work to do. It's just now that it was going to be difficult. Could uh, Eve, Adam and Eve have produced a child before the fall? Yeah. The Bible, in fact, God had commanded them, be fruitful and what? Multiply and replenish the earth. They, they could have had a child before the fall. The difference was not that Eve could now have children. It was just that there's going to be pain during childbirth. Okay, Jeannie? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. In fact, you know, where did the work week come from? See, every other, almost every other phenomenon as far as our time systems are based on the earth, the earth's rotation, uh, the earth's rotation around the sun, um, all of that's out there in, um, in nature. But the work week has no explanation other than what? Creation. Six days God worked and rested on the seventh day, seven day work week, or seven day week. And that's where we get the week from. And uh, there's no other explanation for it. In fact, is it, uh, Exodus 29, six days shalt thou labor and do what? All thy work. It's time to work, folks. The New Testament commands us to work. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he what? Neither should he eat. 
When Jesus came to earth, He learned the occupation of a carpenter, did He not? Now His Father, He's referred to as the carpenter's son in a couple of places. But in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, listen to this. Is not this the carpenter? Jesus Himself was a carpenter. His dad taught Him how to work. Jesus got in there and used tools. And Jesus got out there and labored with His hands. It was a part of the Jewish uh, way of life, wasn't it? That a, that a child learned to have some form of occupation. Paul was a what? A tent maker. Okay, He could work with his hands. If there were no jobs available, he had a job, didn't he? And they taught him to do that. Sadly, our society is moving toward the idea of less work or no work. Do you know that? It's unbelievable. I, I, just, I, I can't fathom it. You know, I, I wasn't taught that way. I was taught you know, a work ethic. You need to put your heart and your soul in your work. You need to labor. And yet today we live in a society that is doing everything they can do not to work. Right? Let's go to a four-day week, a three-day week, a two-day week. Uh, let's have universal income. Okay, y'all know what that is, right? You don't work, the government just gives you money. Okay, the question is, where does the government get the money? From those who work, right? But if you quit work, then what happens? Then there's no, in, there's no government money coming in to provide the universal income for everybody. Okay, so it's, you know, they're going to bite the hand that feeds them eventually. Okay, it's uh, just unbelievable. Um, but that is not, again, this also I saw that it was from the hand of God. Folks, God wants us to work and labor. Now look at Ecclesiastes 2.25. For who can eat? Or who else can hasten hereunto more than I? Solomon says, I know what it's like to enjoy the fruits of my labors. Wouldn't you love to have been Solomon? <laughs> Point A there, Solomon was the epitome of one being able to enjoy the fruit of his labor, folks. He's the epitome of it. Anything his heart's desire, he could have had it, couldn't he? It didn't matter where it was. It didn't matter how much it cost. Didn't matter how big it was. Didn't matter how rare it was. If Solomon wanted it, all he had to say is what? Hey boys, go get it. That's all he had to say. The richest, wealthiest, wisest man on all the earth. Unbelievable. And that's what he's saying. He, the reason he says it is because I want you to understand that I know what I'm talking about. I'm the one carrying on the experiment. I'm the one who is learning from this. And if anybody can enjoy the fruits of his labor, guess what? It's me. Notice how he, well, the question that he asked, Who can eat or else can hasten unto more than I? And the answer to that is what? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody can enjoy it more than I. So he knows what he's talking about. Ecclesiastes 2.26 For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Who does he stick right in the middle of everything again? God's right in the middle of it. We're not, we don't have time to do this this morning. This verse talks about two laws. Okay? Two laws. Now let me ask you something. Are there exceptions to laws? Yes. Okay? Let me give you an illustration. Okay? Jesus. Was Jesus baptized of John the Baptist? Yes. What was the purpose of John's baptism? For the remission of sins. Okay? 
That's the reason John was baptizing. For the remission of sins. Did Jesus have sin? So why was He baptized? You see, He was the what? He was the exception to the law. He did it for one reason and one reason only. Because God said to do it. That's the only reason. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. The Bible says all thy commandments are righteousness. Psalm 119, 172. The Lord did it for one reason. And did he have to convince John to do it? Oh yeah. John said, I have need to be baptized of thee and comest thou to me. Suffer it so to be so now. There are exceptions to laws. Now, the reason I say that is this. Next week we're going to come in and we're going to talk about two laws that are found in this verse. And the first thing that somebody's going to do is say what? That ain't true. And you're going to point me to some exception to the rule. And I want you to know, I already know that there's exceptions. Okay? So don't do that to me next week. So be looking for those two laws that are in, the, in that verse. And we'll talk about them next week. And guys, that will end chapter 2. And that gets us into chapter... Three, and there's a lengthy list in chapter 3. That's a beautiful text, is it not? In fact, it has even been um, the verse of songs that have been written, isn't it? There is a time for every purpose under heaven, isn't there? And we'll be talking about some of those in next week's lesson. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff.